Hi, I'm Renee Ortiz. Welcome to my kitchen studio. I am down here today because my regular studio is kind of a mess at the moment and I need to drastically overhaul it. But for now we have a little bit more room here and I came today because I want to work on a project with you. I have been taking the most amazing class over the last six weeks. It is studying under the masters. It's a Jeannie Oliver class. She has these guests uh, teachers that have been just imparting so much amazing information on incredible artists and it's been so much fun and meeting classmates too and it's an online class and it's been great. Well, this week is kind of different because week seven we have a little break which is fabulous because we can catch up and, and, and work on other projects and, and do more homework <laughs> so to speak or or not. Um, but I just thought, you know what, why not try to do a little bit of my own teaching. I have some workshops coming up this summer and I just really wanted to practice and see if I can do something similar. So to emulate my great predecessors, um, welcome to Studying Under a Master with me, Renee Ortiz. I'm a a little about, about me. I'm a professional, well, trying to be a professional artist. I was an artist years and years ago and took a break to get married and have kids and homeschool my kids. And I've seen two off to college and one ballerina left in the house. She's got another year and a half and then she'll be out the door. And I started really seeing this empty hole in my life and thinking, oh, I need to do something with it. So I started introducing art back into it, making it more of a full-time thing. And the less I have in the homeschooling realm and the ballet world, the more time I'll have to put towards my professional art career that I'm thinking is what's going to follow all of this grand adventure in my life. So anyway, that's me. I paint Every day, I've been doing that for nearly two years, and April will be two years of completing a painting a day. It was a challenge I started because I'm so bad at finishing things. So I decided I'm going to finish a painting, and then the next day I was going to finish another one and another one, and it's continued now. I have, of course, my amazing ballerina daughter is my stopper in life. She's the one that looks at my painting and says, it's done, don't work on it any further because you're just going to muddy it. So, and she's always right on those things. So I listen to her and, and now over the two years, I've gotten pretty good at knowing it's like, okay, it's done. It's finished. I can just post it on Facebook and be done with it. And maybe it's not the best, but it's okay. Anyway, there, there we are. Well, back to studying under the master. The master that I chose for this week, if you care to join me, is Mary Cassatt. Mary Cassatt is, I don't know, I've always been drawn to her, probably because I'm a mom. I love my kids so dearly. And she depicts the mothers and their children in such a beautiful way. She was never a mom herself, which is surprising because she just has this way of capturing it that you would think she's got this heart of a mom. And she probably does, but without the kids. So she, um, a little bit about history of Mary Cassatt is she's um, an American artist. She was uh, lived her life in Pennsylvania, in what's now Pittsburgh. She grew up there and actually as a child traveled through Europe. Her parents were mid upper middle class and wanted the children to have an education to see art in the world and there really wasn't a lot of really great art in America that time to, be, to see. There were some but to see the really great masters and everything they wanted to expose her to that and the other children. I think she was one of seven and five of which survived. Anyway she uh, loved it and just really um, gleaned all she could. She came back. They came back to America and she really wanted to be an artist. Well, much to the surprise and shock of her father, he didn't really quite agree with it and um, didn't think that was a place for uh, a woman. But this was, well, this was the time period, I forgot to tell you. She was born in 1844, lived um, until 1926, and she went to art school then in, in Pennsylvania at Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and she was there actually during the whole duration of the Civil, the American Civil War, which is pretty interesting because 
well, when she started, I guess it was about 20% women. I'm imagining throughout the war years it became much less men as they moved on to, to go fight. But anyway, she was there during this time, and it was good. She learned a lot, except she wasn't being pushed or stretched, and she wasn't allowed to work on live models because women were not allowed to at that time. So she painted and drew from casts, um, from other works, and she really wanted more. So she decided she wanted to go back to Europe. Well, her parents said no. Her dad said absolutely not. But she um, finally convinced them. And I think her mom escorted her the first trip back there. And she she did end up getting to go and study. Well, while women were not allowed to study in the school there, they were allowed to study under apprentice conditions. Um, so she studied under, and I'm trying to remember the guy's name, oh yeah, Jean-Léon Jérôme. So hopefully my French is not too awful, but I'm studying French with my daughter and it's pretty challenging. Anyway, uh, she studied under him and he took her on and she did a combination of that and exactly what we're doing in this class, copying the masters. So she got to go into the Louvre and copy amazing paintings. Well, she got a special permit to do it, which I think is kind of neat or interesting why they would have this. Apparently, um, the women artists would go in and copy certain masters and sell them as copies to people. And in order to control this, this trade of art or whatever, uh, the the Louvre set up a, a permit situation where you had to have a special permit to go in. Anyway, so she did that and she got um, her education by copying masters, by doing what we're doing in this class, taking an artist, studying their brush strokes, looking at their color palette, um, examining what they do and trying to replicate it and not to put off their work as our own, but rather to learn from it and then integrate the parts of it that we like that fit with our own style, that fit with our own way of seeing. So that's what she did. And she definitely had her own way of seeing. A lot of people peg her as uh, the first American Impressionist, um, which uh, probably was um, one of them, but she doesn't like to call herself an Impressionist artist. She did actually a lot of um, her original, her, her early work was not impressionistic at all. Um, as she moved in to the group, okay, so, all right, so she's in Paris, she's learning, blah, blah, blah. She tries to get into the salon. That's where all the traditional artists are displaying their works. Well, it's not easy to get into the salon. She keeps applying and applying and applying for, for years. She applies and doesn't get accepted. And so, gosh, that just rings too true. I mean, I send stuff off to competitions on a regular basis, and it's in rejection, 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 and, you know, finally something comes through, and it's like, oh, yay. So, and that's what happened for her. She got accepted into the salon um, eventually. And she uh, actually had works going there for seven years, and I'm bad at remembering years. So anyway, yeah, from 1971, it was when she got accepted in, and for seven years, she had work showing in the salon, which was pretty neat. Uh, but then she had a dry spell, <laughs> which we all hit. And she had a, a, a time of not having anything accepted. And she got very discouraged. And she eventually uh, went home, went back to, to America. Um, okay, so back when she was back in the United States, oh, interesting, her dad refused to pay for her art supplies. But, so she decided, well, she's got to do good enough work. She didn't want to cheapen her work and make it just work that would sell, but rather she wanted to be true to what her vision was and make this artwork that she wanted to make. And whether or not it sold, it didn't matter, but she thought she made enough great pieces, you know, she could afford to buy her own art supplies and not worry about what her dad was doing. She was pretty upset with him, and I think she even, at one point, um, tore up his portrait, <laughs> which probably wasn't very nice, but anyway, <laughs> she did. And she was just kind of ready to give up, but uh, she moved, got out of the house, and moved to Chicago, and I thought it was kind of interesting, but she was in Chicago at the time of the Great Chicago Fire, Mrs. O'Leary's cow and all of that, and her work got, a lot of her work got destroyed in that. I thought that was fairly 
sad. Um, after Chicago, she got with the Pittsburgh uh, Archbishop of Pittsburgh, commissioned her and wanted her to go back to Italy. Yay, big lucky break. Go back to Italy and copy a couple of paintings for him. And so she did gladly. She got to go back and be around art that she wanted to be around and paint and get paid for it. And she did. And while she was there, oh, people were just so excited about her. She got accepted into, into the art world and people were noticing her. And it was just a really, really good time for her. So, uh, yeah, she got received into the salon. Oh, okay, that's the time, actually that she got received into the salon because before it was 10 years of not getting received in the salon. So get the, the, the date straight. I'm so bad at this. And I'm a teacher. <laughs> anyway, 1871 is when she's back there. That's when she got into the salon. And you know what's really cool? Have you ever read um, Little Women? Well, May, which is uh, Abigail May Alcott, Louise's sister, was actually... Um, in in Paris at the time and then when you know in the part in the book when she's studying art she actually got to go and meet Mary Cassatt and I just think that's just such a neat little part to, to know that they they connected at one point I thought that's really cool I love when worlds come together like that my favorite book one of my favorite artists and wow they met that's neat so anyway that was at that time she was accepted she was getting notoriety she was into the salon seven years living in in, in Europe painting with these artists and then she hit a time of like Nothing, get accept, nothing getting accepted again. Um, falling out of favor a little bit. Uh, well, then along comes, um, along comes Ed, Edgar Degas. Now, Edgar noticed her and really loved her work, and that was a lot coming from him. He didn't think much of women artists, but she was exceptional. And he invited her to be one of the Impressionists group. And Impressionists, like, okay, yeah, we're a bunch of outcasts and nobody likes us and they won't hang us in the salon. We're going to have our own show and so what? Um, come join us. And, you know, who would say yes to that? But she did. So, and it was a good move because, wow, she's studying with Renoir. She's, she's painting aside Cezanne. She's with, uh, she, she, she's, she's, She's with the great Impressionist, you know, Monet, <laughs> one of my favorites. Can you imagine if I had to go back in time, if I had to, if I got to go back in time, wow, that would be a time to be Mary Cassatt in this world of mostly men, artists, women were not exactly accepted as an art, as a career, um, and she was there, and she was painting alongside the greats, and not only just painting alongside them, and not good for a woman. She was good because she was good. She was amazing. And, wow, what an honor and what a neat thing to, to do. So, I can't go back in time, <laughs> but I can uh, still try to paint beside the greats and copy and emulate and do what they do and and wish and dream and all of those things. <sighs> I know I'm goofy. All right, so let's see. Oh, so when she's in this group of Impressionists, this is when she met what, who later became one of her dearest, dearest friends, um, Bertha Morsaw. And Bertha Morsaw, let me see if I can say her name properly, French, Bertha Morsaw. <laughs> no, I don't know. Anyway, um, was also one of the impressionists in the group and they got to be really close and she uh, confided her learned from her um, oh the other part too I forgot to mention when she was you know right before she was invited she really was an admirer of Degas she had looked in the window of the galleries and I could just picture this scene in fact it's one I want to paint someday of her nose pressed against the glass apparently looking at his art and just being in awe of it and wanting to know more looking at his pastels and here she had been painting in oil but she was just in awe of his pastels and that means a lot to me because I'm a pastel artist primarily I also do encaustics those are my two favorites um so neat there she was, looking at the stuff, admiring his work, big giant fan, and it's like, ah, and he comes in and fights her. 
Wow, what a lucky break. What an amazing thing. So she did a lot with him. She did a lot. They learned together. He respected her. She respected him. They experimented. They were even going to do a book project together, but he dropped it, and that kind of irked her a little bit. But they were experimenting with printmaking and dry point and aqua tints and things like that that were really different for the day. So when you go to the New York uh, Public Library, you'll see some of that work. I think some is in the uh, Museum of Art as well, the Metropolitan. But the um, New York Public Library has one of her famous um, graphic designs there. And I just think it's just really lovely and really different. And I remember first seeing it when I was there with my son, taking him to college and doing different things. And, and I didn't, and I thought, wow, that looks an awful lot like Mary Cassatt. And it was something I wasn't even aware of. And sure enough, it was. So I was like, yeah, I know my stuff, <laughs> but not really. So anyway, um, let's see. So she's, uh, back to U.S., um, during the time of the Franco-Prussian War, she came back. It was probably a safer place to be. And she came home and was, was working there and painting and producing quite a bit for years and years and years and years. And later she's diagnosed with diabetes. She starts losing her sight, but she keeps going. And wow, what what a um, inspiration, I think, that even with just different ailments and things, we can keep painting and keep painting. And maybe our vision changes, but hey, that's what they thought of the Impressionists in the first place. They, When the Impressionists came out, they said, oh, they've got some weird disease of the eye that's contagious. <laughs> anyway, that's what some people were saying. Um, but she kept, she kept doing her work, and she kept producing and doing her vision. She was true to her vision. She, she saw things the way she wanted to see things. And she didn't want to be pegged as an Impressionist or any other type of artist. She just wanted to paint, and she just wanted to do it the way she wanted to do it. And she did. Um, she got known as an American uh, female uh, woman artist kind of thing, and she didn't even want to be pegged as that. She wanted to be known as a great artist, not a great woman artist. However, she attached herself at one point to one of the big women's suffrage campaigns going at the time in the United States, and which was fine, except her sister-in-law totally boycotted it, and I thought that was kind of mean. Um, which then she reciprocated by selling the work that her sister-in-law was in back to the Metropolitan Museum of Art instead of leaving it to her and her daughter and, you know, niece, I mean. So <laughs> her sister and her niece lost out on that. Um, but she, you know, she did what she felt was right and she lived her life and she's amazing. So, I hope you got a little taste of who Mary Cassatt is. Um, look at her art. Oh, yeah, I want to show you. I'm really strange, but I homeschool my kids, and now they're all grown. But I have this really cool series of books that we used to go through that had um, various artists focus on them. And so I had this one on Mary, and I looked at my bookshelf, and I had this one on Mary, and I thought, oh, yeah. I remember reading these to my kids when they were little guys and preparing them for art. Okay, so one is probably going to be a doctor or researcher or discover a cure for cancer, and the one's a ballerina, so okay, that's an art, and one's probably going to be president, so we'll see. Anyway, um, I remember going to the museum, uh, oh, it was in Washington, D.C., and seeing this particular painting, uh, and I said, oh, that's my little girl. That's her exactly. Just flopped on a chair, not even thinking about it. <laughs> Of course, she's more grown up, and I don't think she would be sitting quite in that manner anymore, and she's a little bit more aware. But at that point, I thought, oh, wow, that's her. They've got her pegged. Anyway, Mary Cassatt just painted from life. She painted, she painted these beautiful depictions of mothers and their babies, of, of um, just tender moments. She captured life. She framed it um, where... She would show you what she wanted to show you. Instead of having, you know, her earlier works where they were so formal, formal setting, formal dark, dark backgrounds like the masters painted, she started doing more of what the Impressionists were doing. She even took a sketchbook out and would sit out and sketch people in real life situations and just started pouring that into herself. And then that poured out in her painting. She was just really able to see those tender moments and, and get them. And 
That's a huge encouragement. I mean, it's so easy to leave the sketchbook at home. <laughs> Last night, I was at Starbucks, and, you know, I said, I yeah, I don't care. If people look over my shoulder. I'm just going to just, and, and, and hopefully they won't, but maybe they will. Anyway, I'm just going to bring my sketchbook and just start noticing people and sketching a little more often. It's something I just don't do enough because I'm always worried about what people will think, you know, like, why is she sketching? She's not all that great. <laughs> but... I don't know why I worry, but anyway, just do it. It's so great to go out and see things and frame things. What stands out? What do you see that's worth putting on a piece of paper? And sketchbooks are great because you just hide them under your bed and nobody will ever see them. <laughs> so do it. Make it a practice. I just really encourage you because it's a great thing. And painting every day has been a great thing for me. I post on Facebook and wow, some of them are really bad. Some of them are done at midnight just because, like, i got to get my painting done, but I've been at a debate tournament all day or whatever it was, and and you know what? i got to get a painting done. I don't care what it looks like, so I do, and I post it, and I don't care, and so I'm really happy to finally be at the point. It's like, I don't care. Yes, I care about a lot of my paintings and my major works I do care about, but my daily paintings, they've been so helpful in growing me as an artist, and bringing me to this point in my life now. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to be teaching some art workshops. I'm going to hopefully just continue painting and exhibiting and oh, submitting and submitting and submitting and rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and whatever. But I'm going to keep doing what I do. Uh, God's put it on my heart. I'll do it and see where it goes. Thank you for joining me in this. Next part, we'll see if we can take on a project together. Thanks.